I'd really like to um, introduce um, Keir Winesmith, and um, Keir has a diverse um, background in media technology and digital management, and he's led development teams, created new media products, and has developed strategy for web, audio, video, virtual, social, and mobile products. Uh, he's also done postgraduate research into the collaborative development of interactive computer systems, and is currently the manager of digital media for the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney. Um, and he tweets at Dr. Keir. Um, I met, um, or Adrian introduced me to, to Kier a few weeks back um, on the balcony of the new MCA Cafe and it was a really lovely afternoon, we were bathed in sunshine, there were notable artists enjoying coffee, I did spot a few people I'd recognised off TV sitting around, <laughs> so, yeah. oh, I, saw, I saw that woman on that photo show on Channel 2 the other night um, and we were looking out to the Opera House and, um, and I think it's really hard to come by a more intense kind of place experience actually than that. And it was really interesting because there we were actually talking about the digital experience um, that, that you can now have in a museum and some of the work that um, Kia has been doing more recently um, at the MCA. So I'm really excited to, um, to hand over to, to Kia and um, he's going to um, talk a bit about um, this proposition. So um, I've, I've been introduced, so that's my name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's where I work. Uh, which has changed a little bit recently. Um, I started just as it was a building site, and I started because it was a building site, and I thought there was an opportunity to change the digital with the physical. And I also was pretty interested in working with that as my office U. Um, it's but like everyone else, pretty much here I work in one of these. Anyway. <laughs> but I can walk outside of that. <laughs> so. Anyway, it's, the reason I started the MCA and the reason I want to talk about these sorts of topics is um, I spoke to Lizanne McGregor at a social function and she said to me, oh, we're looking for someone digital. And I said, oh, I saw the job application you put out, but I think you got the pitch wrong. And she said, yeah, we did get it wrong. We didn't get the applicants we wanted. And so I said, well, I'll help you change it. <laughs> um, so I changed it into something that was, was about reimagining the MCA virtually and digitally and physically at the same time. And they got really excited about that, so I was given an incredibly wide remit. So there's been an enormous amount of digital change at the MCA since I started, so we've pretty much replaced every piece of technology and every piece of digital thinking that the museum does. We've changed direction in lots of places. And everything we do and everything that I've tried to do there has been about telling stories for people like this in the museum. In the last, since we got the place open, we've started trying to tell stories to people who aren't coming to the museum. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to do it through an example. So this is a work called Tango by a woman called Helen Eager. Um, you might remember it from the first slide. It's the one down the bottom that you walk past and you walk into the foyer from um, the quayside. And pretty much what we did in terms of storytelling My was stuff like this. My name is Helen Eager and I paint and draw and uh, make prints and do a bit of media uh, work. <laughs> The work's called Tango, I mentioned that. <laughs> the work that I've just done for the MCA is called Tango. It's a very rare opportunity to, to do something as fantastic as this. It's a different thing, it's a very public space, it's very large. Uh, so I'm going to talk over her, uh, it goes on for a few minutes. So this is how the MCA has been telling stories uh, about the works, the, the thinking behind them by the artists who create them. So there's a commission that we did. So part of the commissioning process is asking artists to put aside time to kind of reveal some of their practice and some of their creative thinking for on-site and off-site audiences. And for off-site audiences, for the most part, that was people who went to our website or students who downloaded our downloadable material for teachers to use in class. So what I've been trying to do since I started is to take the off-site and give more of the on-site, um, the collaborative and investigative experiences that you can have only by being in a museum. We're trying to take them out um, to all parts of the country, hopefully in the future, as video conferencing improves, but at the very least we're taking it out to all over New South Wales. So we're going to go to this, and I'm going to alt-tab, and this may or may not work, to Chrome, no. Chrome. 
So this is something. This is something that we did because I spent money on it because I think it's important. Um, <laughs> so this is a virtual tour of the MCA in the middle of the building work. So this is what we looked like two weeks before we opened to the public. Wow. So this is kind of crazy. Two, weeks? two literally two weeks. I shot this two weeks before we opened the public. You can tell because I'm standing there on my phone sending emails. <coughs> what we wanted to do for the, the students, mainly it's students we work with, so we've, we're doing a thing on Tuesday next week with Norfolk Island, so we're taking our virtual stories to, to schools all around New South Wales, um, and we're taking them to schools that aren't even quite in New South, New South Wales, so Norfolk Island's almost as far away as the far side of New Zealand. It's almost at um, New Caledonia. So we're telling stories to them about what it's like to be in the MCA. They will never come to the MCA, they've never seen the MCA, and they have no intention of coming. So we've got to bring them virtually to the shared space that it is. So we share that space by telling stories like this. So we say, this is what we got, what we started with, and we worked with an artist, Helen Eager, to create this in that space. So this is what it looks like when it's finished. And so that's the MCA, that's the circular key you'd be familiar with. So to give the kids a sense of scale and to give them that as something to take home and play with afterwards. We have lots of other ones about how this is situated in the city. So we have um, panoramas leading up to the MCA and in other parts of the MCA. So you can kind of find the work in the full situation. So you can hear the artists talk about it. You can see the location, but you can also have a conversation about it. So I'm going to alt tab back to Keynote. Please work. Um, and I'm going to show you, which again I'm going to talk about. <laughs> so this is a couple of our artist educators talking to a group of students out in Juni, I think. And so they're talking about, um, they're talking about two types of dancing in art. And so at this point they're talking about what the kids could wear. So uh, Juni North, sorry. Uh, apologies to the members of Juni. <laughs> Were you doing it with Like fresh feelings? Yeah, that express field, that's really the point actually. Do you express feelings in your art? Yes. Do we express feelings in our art? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and then you could also do some paintings or things about um, thinking about you, how you express So I'm going to talk over them again because I haven't had time. So we spend an hour with the students and we bring them virtually into the gallery, but we try to make it exciting, we try to make it fun and we try to make it investigative. So we send them out stuff for them to play with before we get there. We send them out stuff to play with while we're on the phone and stuff to play with after we've left. So we use um, basically Skype on steroids. It's a video conferencing technology. And we make it as playful as possible. Because it is tango, we tango with the kids during the talk. It's not just make a thing. It's not just listen to us. It's certainly not just talk and talk. So there's this is then about to start. This is going to be it might be hard to see at the back, but the kids have made tango triangles together. They've got one arm straight, one arm bent, and so they're all triangles and they're going in order and then they get taught to go back in the other direction. And we're in front of this enormous orange wall and we're telling stories about how the artists make work and how you can possibly <laughs> interpret them. And we're trying to make it fun, we're trying to make it engaging, we're trying to make contemporary art, which can be a genuinely difficult thing for adults to consume. It can be a challenging experience being in a contemporary art museum. We're trying to make it a place where you can take mental risks in safety and that's kind of our goal is to be a dangerous place that is fun um, which is which is difficult part of what makes contemporary art really interesting hey, so here, I, I grew up near there I was, oh really yeah, yeah. Well, maybe 50 or 100 k's from there awesome that is amazing you you don't have access to that as as a kid and I'm sure the teachers the teachers don't have access to that either that is that's incredible. That's so amazing. We've booked out every session that we've put online. We'd, we'd like to do more, but it's a kind of funding thing. So every one that we can do, we try to do. And I know there's there's fantastic other projects going. I'm going to do what my dad does, which is always talk about me in his talks. I'm going to talk about my wife in this talk. Um, <laughs> she wrote the digital excursion for the Opera House, which takes kids on digital excursions through the bowels of the Opera House and actually gives them preferential treatment. So they get to see bits of the Opera House that you know, the, the general public can't see. And we do that when we have artists come out, we actually have them give a talk, but the, we get them to do a video conference too. So a group, two groups of students from randomly chosen schools get more access to international artists than 
the sort of pain public do, and that's important to us. And that's why we put the cafe in the best place in the museum, mm -hmm. and we put the education wing in the second best place in the museum, because <laughs> we want to make it a safe place to talk about these things and to be challenged by work. And we want to put the galleries and the, the, the education spaces side by side. And we want to make that physical experience replicate when we, when we have virtual experiences. So we want to give people rich virtual experiences of being in the museum. So, okay, so that's what we do now. Um, and I want to just talk for a couple of minutes, and this is what I guess I'm hoping to get questions about. This is what I want to do in the future. And I haven't quite nailed exactly how it's been. I've been talking to a few different people about it. But I'd like to take this notion of a shared cultural space where it's dangerous but safe in a way to be dangerous. I want to take that um, beyond the schoolroom and I want to make that a shared space for you to investigate the Museum of Contemporary Art. So we have this idea of a 24-hour museum. A few other people are banding that around. What they essentially mean is we've got a really nice collection website. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about giving people the agency to investigate the museum themselves, be in charge of that, and have that happen digitally, online, as soon as they leave the museum, or before they come to the museum, or at a time when they're never ever going to go to the museum ever. But also make that agency happen when you're physically with the museum, so digitally expose the museum when it's closed at night. So maybe it's projecting the museum on the outside of the museum and letting you take control of that and navigate it. And maybe it's not the real museum, maybe it's a totally different museum. Maybe you're walking through the Louvre as you walk digitally through the MCA. I'm not sure. But I'm interested in um, that play and that nexus, now that we've kind of got the bedrock going well, I think it's now time to shake it again. So that's my uh, contention, that museums shouldn't be closed, they should always be open, and that contemporary art museums, I guess, especially ones that are kind of kitted out like ours, have an opportunity to be really innovative in how they engage with audiences and how they mix a digital and virtual. So that's the kind of, that's the, cult, that's the place that I'd like to create using technology. Hmm. Yeah. So questions for Kia. Can I ask how you actually search it? Say for example, I've seen in Europe they've got these lawnmowers with which you don't have to push them, you just turn on, they do it all on their own, they wander around and do all the work. Yeah. It, so when you're just filming around the art gallery or the museum, mm. is it possible to actually you can control it from your own mouse on your computer where you go, or what? There's a, there's a project I wanted to do, but someone got there first with some NBN funding, damn them. Um, <laughs> it's called the Museum Robot, and it's a robot that lives in the museum after dark, yeah. and it, they haven't finished yet, but they're working on it. And it will drive around the museum for you and show you stuff. That's amazing. Which is really cool. Do a flying one, you'll get a flying one. We could, yeah, we could, we could, we could, we could, we could definitely get a flying one. So you said like Google Maps for a museum, yeah? Well, that yeah, well, yeah, that already exists. So I'm talking <laughs> to Google at the moment about that. So, um, yeah. So, but I don't. My I don't want to do stuff that's necessarily literal, or is only literal. So the goal is to maybe take the museum and give the uh, the, the collection, for example, make that always the collection, but make every other room in the museum open for artists to create work. So yes, you've got a museum kind of virtual tool you can do for yourself. But you'll go into one room and you'll end up in the desert. Mm. Is oh, the that's idea. Like my dreams. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you do that, you're like, oh my god, there's new rooms in my palace, and I'm yeah. in the desert, or I'm on a boat, or. <laughs> yeah, places for um, <laughs> places for digital, like that, that idea. Mm. Strikes me as a sort of as a an art object in itself. Yeah. So mm. you know, when did the your role as a kind of digital curator? Hey, Emma. Fuzz <laughs> 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 um, over into being um, um, being an artist. Uh, that's an interesting question. So I um, spent a lot of time not being an artist. Uh, so I, I was doing quite a lot of art making when I was doing my PhD, and I kind of put that down and lived for lived for three or four years as a technologist. And I, I guess this role is a nice counterpoint, and it. The MCA is an interesting place. We probably have about an 80% artist employment rate, but the people that we employ are doing their day job. Mm -hmm. And there's a really strong sense that you don't have the staff doing art, you have artists doing art. And the staff can do art, but kind of not at the MCA. 
So I, to, I, to be honest, it's a good question, and I'm trying to push that boundary, but I think I'll lose. understand what you can make are you know, have to fall on one side or another. They either have to fall as artists or fall as creative technologists, mm. advertising agencies. <laughs> <laughs> no shame in that. They become academics. I think I'm entering it. There's maybe a third way. Yeah. Um, like before, how how do you resolve that? This is a for me. It seems to be a problem. I'm seeing it a lot that mm. that they, there aren't mm. artists. Yeah, so, uh, so I have a few, there's a few solutions to that that I see. So we work with a lot of people who um, create work that's not physical. Um, so we create a lot of, we work with a lot of people who create experiential work. So actually right now on tonight and the last Friday of every month is Art Bar. Uh-oh. Flash. So that's, <laughs> so there's a, there's a kind of stop. filmmaker ex-performance artist called Jess Olivieri who's doing work with like Kanye and stuff now, but grew up doing performance art in you know, small venues in Sydney. And we've asked her to spend a night, to curate a night of stuff. And none of those things that she's making are art objects. They're kind of experiences and their collaborations and their sound and their performance and their things. Or that some of them are things, but you know. So there's, I think there are, there is lots of opportunities for people to have artistic, creative aspects in roles that aren't specified as like I'm an artist creating an art object, yeah. and a lot of that is you've got to set that agenda as being part of what you do. So I'm a big believer in short contracts and then changing your uh, KPIs every year and saying actually <laughs> this year I need to do more of X. And so that's like that's personal agency that does that, I guess. And then, yeah, I don't know. Are you across the idea of flipping the classroom, which is that you you give your students a whole bunch of YouTubes to take home and watch, mm. which are the content of your of, of your lesson, mm. and then they come back and they do their homework in the class with the teacher with them. So, like, the, the high-level cognitive stuff gets done with the teacher there, and the boring stuff is done at home on YouTube, right? So, I think we have a really... I think the MCA, and talking with the other institutions who do similar work that I do, I think we have a really utopian vision of what um, the kind of digital classroom is, and especially our role in it. We, like, will create these documents that are kind of PowerPoint present, like the interactive whiteboard stuff where we think that the kids have done their bit of homework the night before and they've watched these videos who've created with these interviews these artists and the, the teacher is taking all of the, going through linearly through the things we've given them and we think, oh my God, this is great, this is great content. And I reckon 99% of the time the teacher has cherry picked the three things that work for them and they've dumped the rest. Mm -hmm. And so how teachers, so trying to support how teachers work and how they engage with their students is actually really hard and really expensive and I don't think institutions like mine do it very well so what we're trying to do with stuff like the video conferencing is preference them with access to people who think and create and let them ask questions because we see that that's always going to be valuable and then we'll give them a box of resources and the teachers it's up to the teachers to pick and choose as they see fit and I'm trying to retrofit our back catalogue of artist voice interviews to break them all into chunks that are thematic or that are keyword driven so you can watch the whole interview if you want but if you're just teaching like sculpture technique then here's like 10 bits of sculpture technique from 10 artists over the last 20 years and that's just the bits that you want and you're interested in and you can suck that out and choose to use it if you want so like that argument has been one that has been won and sorry, won and fought before I started and everyone believes that's actually, we just need to provide the resources and you'll be able to slice them any way you want and that teachers choose because being prescriptive doesn't work. That's, I don't know, that's my theory, but uh, it's hard to practice it. Is that right? Yeah. My wife Great. is also a teacher. <laughs> I think it also assumes, you know, that kids have technology at home. Mm. So if you want to send them to, you know, to watch mm. YouTube, you, you, you assume that all families have access and you know, there are a whole lot of logistic issues. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I, attempting to my, deliver my, the same yeah. content across Australia. Yeah. Mm. And you so, can't, you know, the kids on Palm Island. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's why you need the Yeah, that's, I mean, yeah. that's also, uh, it's definitely why you need an NBN, and that's also why we, we um, send physical artifacts to people. And it's so we allow for a mix, and we're really prescriptive of that hour is like, you know, kind of peaky learning and, and super fun, and you get to make stuff that you get to keep. And the other thing we're doing is when students come in on site, there's kind of, you know, there's paper mache sort of stuff, but we have like digital paper mache, and you keep a USB stick with the stuff that you made, and where possible, um, share where to allow you to keep editing it when you get home. So it's got a little MCA branding on it, we hand it to you where you go, kids take it home. Mm. The main reason we're doing that is because we wanted to upload all of that content to our website, but the, um, <coughs> the legality around that is really dangerous. So if we give it to you, mm. then and your parents put it on YouTube, that's cool, because <laughs> <laughs> like, they're your kids. Whereas if we put it on YouTube, that's someone else's kids. So we've had, that's a, from a kind of um, child protection point of view, but also... <coughs> Like an ongoing engagement point of view, so it's kind of uh, two wins. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to talk my way out of that. <laughs> <laughs> the things you find out when you actually, you know, consult a lawyer on these things, you know. Mm. Who wants yeah. That's actually a great yeah. model, though, because the artist owns the art. Mm. Yeah, the, the kids, the, the kids own it, and where we can, we use Shareware yeah. products, and then we, really could, and they're all really low, like they're all like small downloads, and for less than a dollar you can buy a USB stick and stick stuff on it. So that's definitely our approach. So Kia, how do you think this changes people's experience of visiting the MCA? Um, so this is, so I, I gave a talk earlier in the week to the guides. So we have, we're different to a lot of institutions. We don't conflate security with uh, invigilation of the works. We actually hire mostly artists and sort of art students and people like that to be the invigilators of the spaces. We call them VSO, Visitor Service Officers. I've done it. There you go. It's like they're calling a garbage technician, but it's they're, they're people. <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh! No, 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 that's what I mean. It's, it's calling it a visitor services operator is, a, is, is like an obtuse simplification of what is a really important role in the museum because they, we actively encourage them to engage with the visitors. And one of the things that I want to show, that, so I haven't showed you today, but we've got a digital interpretation app that has stuff like artist interviews and time lapses of installation of really complex works and how things are built and curators talking about works and stuff so you can sit watch the works. Um, but it's BYO device because we can't afford mm -hmm. to hand out iPods. I think it's better. Uh, which, well, mm -hmm. which, but it's different because when you don't have the agency when you're not handed the device, when you hand the device, you're like, oh, maybe. When you download it yourself, then you own it and you own the experience, so you have a really different experience. So mm -hmm. we're really happy with it, but it's hard because we don't sell tickets to tell people that it exists. And when people know that it exists, they love it. But they, it's not a point where you say, that's $10, by the way, we've got a free free app for your smartphone, here's how to download it. People just walk up and they're straight in the galleries, or they're in the cafe and in the galleries. So the visitor services operators or the guides are the people who tell the story of why you do that. And we've watched people, there's a, like, there's a statistical anomaly of people walking up to the um, wall labels and taking a photo of the wall label so they can read it later <laughs> and then standing back and having a look at the work and then running off to the next one and doing that again. So I've gone and bought a thousand headphones, really cheap headphones from China, unfortunately, um, and I've given them to the guides. And if they see someone walking up and taking either just like a photo of the work or a photo of the thing, their role is to walk up to that person and say, you can hear the artist talk about why they made that work. Here's some headphones for you. I'll teach you how to, I'll tell you how to download the app and you can engage and listen to what the curators and the artists have to say about this work, which changes how you mediate that experience, I think. You want to say something, clearly? I'm just going to say, work, I mean, I make apps, I do all the things. I'm fundamentally opposed the whole notion of apps. Problem with apps. <laughs> the problem with apps yeah. is they get in the they way of the user experience. Because mm. if you don't have the app and you're in an environment, you're fucked. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but there's, a, there's, this, there's this intermediate thing you need to do to engage with whatever it is digitally. And it's yeah. like, this is just like, oh, I, I, forgot to I forgot to do that before I left the house or, mm. or whatever. Mm. And then you're fucked. And you so, have a different but isn't that just a... No, I, 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 I don't think you are, but so... <laughs> no, 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 
I, no, I think it's a, it's a valid point and it's something <laughs> that I've really battled with. So we have this, we don't always build apps. We only build apps when we can't build a website that does exactly the same thing. So we've only built, an, we've only built the app and because it has like location it, awareness in it. You can yeah. do location awareness in different ways. It's just expensive. Just the way that we've done it to do it cheap a, enough to fit in the museum. Anyway, right. but, but, but yes, I absolutely agree. But, so what we, what we explicitly do is, okay, do you want to hear this? Yeah, okay. I'm looking <laughs> interested places. So what we explicitly <laughs> do is it's a linear progression which is totally owned by the visitor at how, how deep they want to engage with a particular work and it's up to them. You can stand and watch and be with the work or with your friend socially with the work and then leave it and that's up to you. You can choose to read the wall label if you want and that's again up to you, you don't have to, it's like, it, you know, there's an agency there. On the wall label it has the app number and if you want to have that next layer of experience that's also up to you. I agree there's a bit of barrier there but it's up to you.